So what I have over here is a pendulum. And the pendulum has a length of L, or the pendulum string has a length of L, and the pendulum bob has a mass of M, shown right here. And I'm going to pull back the pendulum horizontally like this, and then I'm going to let go of the pendulum. And when I let go of the pendulum, it's going to follow this path shown in red right here. And at the lowest point of its swing, the pendulum is going to get caught on this thin, tiny peg right here, shown in the circled red. And so when it gets caught, and, and, and the peg is a distance r above the pendulum bob when it gets caught. So I'm, so I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let the pendulum go initially, and then it's going to get caught on this thin peg right here. And when it gets caught on the thin peg, it's going to follow this circular motion right here. Or I mean, the, the pendulum bob, since it gets caught on, the, on, the, on a thin peg, it's going to follow this circular path shown in red right here. And what we want to find is, we want to find what, what is the maximum value of r, or what, is, or what is the maximum value of the radius r if the bob is to, if the pendulum is to swing around in a full circle. So we want, so when the pendulum gets caught on the thin peg, we want the pendulum bob to swing around in a full circle, shown in red. And so in order for the circle, or in order for, or we want to find a value of r such that the path that I highlighted in red or such that the pendulum is able to complete a full circle around the pendulum, or around the thin peg when it gets caught. So I'll write it down right here. We want to find the maximum value of r if the bob is to swing around the peg in a full circle. So let's analyze the forces that are acting on the pendulum bob when it's at its highest point after it gets caught on the pendulum or after it gets caught on the thin peg. So after, so after the pendulum bob gets caught on the thin peg, it's going to look something like this. It's going to swing around in a circle and it's going to come to the top or it's going to come to the top after it gets caught on the peg. And so let's analyze what forces are acting on this, this pendulum bob at its highest position after it gets caught on the thin peg. So there's going to be a weight force which points downward. And because it's connected to a string, there's going to be a tension force which also points downward. So, so in order for the pendulum bob to swing in a full, complete circle, there's an important thing to note about the tension. So we said that the tension points downward, but there's another condition that has to be imposed on the tension. And it's that the tension, in order for it to swing around in a full circle, the tension has to be greater than zero. So if the tension is greater than zero, then the pendulum bob, or the pendulum will swing in a full circle, shown in red. And then, and 
that would be the case if the tension was greater than zero. So if the tension is greater than zero, then the pendulum can swing around in a full circle. But now what if the tension is equal to zero? So if the tension is equal to zero, that means that the string has no tension and that the string will become slack. If the string becomes slack, then the pendulum can't, that means that the pendulum can't swing around in a full circle. So if the tension was equal to zero, it would drop down or it would look something like something like this where it would just drop down because the, te the string has no tension. But we want the tension to be greater than zero so the tension so that the bob can swing in a full circle shown like this. So that's the condition for the tension. The tension has to be greater than zero to swing in a full circle. So since the pendulum bob so since the pendulum bob travels in a circle like this we know that there has to be a centripetal force which acts on the ball or there has to be the centripetal force which is a net force and it acts on the ball since the ball is traveling in a circle like this so since there's circular motion, we know that there has to be a centripetal force which is causing that circular motion. Now there has to be a force which is supplying that centripetal force. force. And so the centripetal force, it points inward. And so now there has to be a force which provides the centripetal force. And that's these two forces right here. It's the mg or the weight force and the tension force. And those two are supplying the centripetal force because they point inward. And the centripetal force also points inward. So these are the two forces which act, these are the two forces which supply the centripetal force. So the tension force and the weight force supply the centripetal force. So since the centripetal force points inward and it's equal to the sum of these two forces, we can write a new a a sum of the forces equation. So we'll denote that the centripetal force is equal to capital F subscript C for centripetal force, and that's equal to the sum of the tension force and the weight force, mg. Because we said that the tension and the, and the weight force are the forces that are causing the, the, the centripetal force. And so the centripetal force, it points inward, and the tension and the weight force also point directly inward. So those are the two forces which are causing or generating the centripetal force. And so let's expand this out. We know that the centripetal force is just equal to the mass of the, of the pendulum, which is m, times the velocity squared divided by the radius r or the radius of the circular path, which is r. And that's equal to tension plus the weight force. So in this equation, you we know the value of m, we know the value of r, and we know that the tension has to be greater than zero because that was the condition that we said earlier and we know the weight force but the only variable that we don't know is the velocity which is v now what's the velocity in this diagram so the velocity in this case 
the velocity is just the velocity of the pendulum bob at the highest point of its swing once it gets caught on the thin peg. And so the velocity points this way after it gets caught on the thin peg. That's the velocity that's in this centripetal force equation. And so right now, the variable that we need to solve for, or the variable that we're looking for, is v, or the speed of the pendulum at the highest point of its swing after it gets caught on the, pen, on the thin peg. So in order to find the velocity v, let, we would have to use some conservation of energy. And we're using conservation of energy because of this. So notice that we initially held, held out the pendulum horizontally like this, and then we dropped it and let it go. So that means that initially all of the energy stored in the pendulum initially right here, or when I held it out in, uh, horizontally, all of that energy is fully transferred into kinetic energy or into into the energy of the pendulum at the bottom. So the initial state is shown in the circled red, and then it's gonna fall down, and then all of that initial energy will equal the final energy at the bottom of its swing. And the bottom of, of its swing is shown in red. And so if we look at the energies stored in the pendulum at, at the initial position, initially when we pull back the pendulum, it's only going to have potential energy. And, and the reason why it has potential is because we pull it back a distance, or we pull it because the pendulum is a height higher than its equilibrium position. And then all of that potential energy is going to be converted into kinetic energy at the bottom. And the reason why it has kinetic is because the pendulum has transferred all of its initial potential energy fully into kinetic energy. And that's why the pendulum is moving at the bottom. All of, It has only kinetic energy at the bottom position. Now what about when the pendulum gets caught on the thin peg and it makes a swing in a circular motion? Then at that point notice that <clears throat> notice that the pendulum at the top of its swing right here it's gonna be a height higher than the bottom position so it's gonna have potential energy and the and since it's moving in a circular motion it's also going to have a velocity so it's also going to have the kinetic energy since it has a velocity at the top so it goes from its initial state of kinetic of potential energy and all of that potential energy is transferred into kinetic energy, and then all of that kinetic energy is transferred into some potential energy and some kinetic energy. So what we want to find is, remember in our centripetal force equation, there's a velocity that's squared. And that velocity corresponds to this velocity of the pendulum right at the top right here. So what we want to find is the velocity of the pendulum at the top. So let's find the kinetic energy since the kinetic energy contains the, the speed of the pendulum at the top. So since energy is conserved as the pendulum swings from its initial position to 
the other positions, we can write a conservation of energy statement that the initial energy of the pendulum is equal to the final energy of the pendulum. And then let's let's find out what is the initial energy, which is denoted with the E subscript I for initial. So notice that all initially all of the initial energy is just stored in the potential energy. And so we can denote all of that potential energy with the capital U subscript G. And all of that and then when we let go of the pendulum, all of that potential energy is converted fully into kinetic energy at the bottom as it swings from its horizontal position to the bottom. So all of the potential energy is fully transferred into kinetic energy at the bottom. And also another thing that we would have to do is set a potential equals zero line. And this is just a point in which the potential energy of the pendulum or the pen potential energy of the pendulum equals zero. Meaning, at this point, this is the point at which the potential energy of the pendulum equals zero. So anytime the pendulum comes across this point, comes across this dashed line, then the potential energy of the pendulum is equal to zero at that at this horizontal dashed line. So when the pendulum comes down and swings to those to its bottom point right here, the bottom point lies on this potential equals zero line. And so when the pendulum is stretched out horizontally like this, and then when it's released, the potential energy of the pendulum at the bottom of its swing will be equal to zero. And then at the bottom of its swing, it will have only kinetic energy. So then let's expand what the, or let's find what the uh, potential energy of this pendulum Bob is so the formula for the potential energy is just the mass of the pendulum which is m times the acceleration due to gravity and times the distance the pendulum bob is from the zero line now we would have to define this distance so it's going to be the mass of the ball times g times whatever distance the ball is or whatever distance the pendulum is from the zero line. Now, what's the distance from the zero line? So notice how we initially stretched out the pendulum like this. And so the, the distance from the zero line is this distance right here. So that's the distance from the mass of the pendulum to the zero line. And so that would be the value, that would be the distance from the zero line. So that's the reason why the bob gains potential energy, because we're, we're holding it out a distance higher than the zero line. So since we hold it since it's a distance higher than the zero line it's going to have some potential energy and so notice that the length of so what is this distance right here so notice that the length of the string is just the variable l and so the the distance that the pendulum bob is from the zero line is just equal to this length of the string which is mg times l so the formula for the potential energy is just mg times the distance the mass is from the zero line which is l in this case and that's equal to the kinetic energy which is one half times 
the mass of the pendulum bob times the velocity at the bottom squared. And the velocity at the bottom is going to point this way, in this red direction right here. And, and since this is the velocity at the bottom, let's denote that with the VB, or a subscript B for bottom. So let's solve this equation for VB, which is the velocity of the pendulum bob at the bottom. So we, we notice that both sides have an M, so we can cancel that out. And we also know that we can multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of the 1 half. So if we do that, we get... So we get that the velocity of the pendulum bob at the top is equal to 2 times g times l, and we take the square root since the velocity is squared. So at the bottom of its swing, the bob has only kinetic energy. But then when the bob gets caught on the thin peg, it goes up and all of that kinetic energy is transferred into potential energy and kinetic energy. And so we can write another conservation of energy statement since all of the, this kinetic energy is transferred into potential and kinetic energy at the top of its swing as it goes around in a circle like this. So let's write another conservation of energy statement. So we know that the initial energy at the bottom is equal to the final energy at the top of its swing. So initially the bob has only kinetic energy because at the bottom that's the only energy it has, just kinetic energy. And then all of that and all of the final energy is stored in potential energy and kinetic energy. And it has potential energy because it's a distance higher than the zero line. So it, it's gained some potential. So to avoid any confusion, I'm going to denote the velocity, the kinetic energy at the bottom of its uh, bottom of the swing as with a B and the kinetic energy at the top with the T for top. So this is the kinetic energy at the top and bottom. If we expand out the left side of the equation, the formula for the kinetic energy is 1 half times the mass of the pendulum bob times the velocity at the bottom squared. And it's the velocity at the bottom because this corresponds to the kinetic energy at the bottom. And that's equal to the potential energy at the top of its swing, which is mg times times whatever distance that pendulum is from the zero line. So the zero line is right here. So the zero line is right here in, in, in the dashed red. And so what we want to find is what is the di what is the height that the pendulum is from this position at the top to that zero line. And so that position right there, so we want to find this position right here. And then we're going to multiply that by m and g to get the formula for the potential energy. So notice that this distance right here, the radius, is just r. And another distance above it, and that's just another r. So it's r plus r. So the entire distance is just 2r. So the distance from the, the top of the swing, or the, the, the top of when the pendulum gets caught on the thin peg and it reaches its highest part of its swing, the distance from the top to the potential equal zero line is 2r. So we just multiply mg by 2r like this. And 
so now we have so now we need an expression for the kinetic energy at the top which is just one half times the mass times the velocity at the top and we're looking for this and we're looking and we want to solve for this velocity t vt at the top so this velocity t or the subscript t denotes the velocity of the pendulum at the top of its swing so this is the variable that we're solving for so let's isolate this variable notice that each of these terms have an m and we can just cancel out those masses and if we want to isolate the variable vt or v subscript t then let's expand out this left hand side so this is the formula for this has the formula for the velocity b at the bottom or vb but remember we found the velocity b at the bottom earlier it was just this formula right here so let's just plug in this formula into this expression and let's just square it squaring it would just get rid of the square root so we would get this formula right here and two and the rest of the equation would look like this and we're solving for vt or the velocity of the pendulum at the top so let's just cancel out these the one half and the two multiply and they cancel out and let's just bring these terms over to that side and then let's multiply both sides by two to get rid of the one half on the vt and that's equal to one half times vt so we just multiply both sides by two to get rid of the one half and that's equal to the velocity of the pendulum bob at the top squared now let's isolate this vt or let's solve for v subscript t so we just take the square root of both sides and if we do that we get this expression right here so the velocity of the pendulum bob at the top of its swing after it gets caught on the thin peg is this entire expression right here 2 times gl minus 2 gr and then the square root of the entire thing so now we have the velocity of the pendulum bob at the top which is what which is what is in our centripetal force equation so the velocity of the pendulum bob at the top is right here drawn on this diagram right here and I denoted the velocity that points to the left with an arrow and in our centripetal force equation this v squared right here corresponds to the velocity at the top which is so we can denote it with the v subscript t for v top so this is the velocity of the pendulum bob at the top of its swing and so this is the formula that we just found this that corresponds to this expression right here for the velocity at the top so now let's just solve for the tension since we know that the tension has to be greater than zero so let's just plug everything in if we square the velocity at the top uh, if we just square that expression so if we plug in the expression for the velocity t or the v the velocity at the top v subscript t and then if we square that expression this is the velocity that we get so it's m over r parentheses 2 parentheses gl minus 2gr and all i did was substitute in the v 
the velocity at the top. And that's equal to the tension plus the weight force, mg. And, and let's solve for the tension. And remember that the condition that the tension, or the condition that we set on the tension was, is that it had to be greater than zero in order for the bob to swing around in a full circle. So since that's the condition, let's just solve for the tension. And whatever the tension equals, we know that whatever it equals has to be greater than zero. So let's just solve for the tension in this case. And if we subtract both sides by mg, we get this expression, which is equal to the tension. And so since this entire expression right here is equal to tension, and the tension also has to be greater than zero, we know that this entire expression right here has to be greater than zero because the tension is greater than zero. And, and the tension has to be greater than zero so the bob can swing in a full circle. So this entire expression right here has to be greater than zero, or in other words, the tension has to be greater than zero. So another thing that we can do is just, instead of writing the tension, let's just replace the tension with the greater than zero sign. And then we can just solve for the radius r. And then remember, if the tension is equal to zero, then the string becomes slack and it's not able to complete a full circle. So if we replace the tension with a greater than zero sign, we get this expression. And we just replace the tension with, uh, with the greater than sign because the left-hand side of the equation, the, the, this entire equation right here, ha we knew that this entire equation right here is equal to tension. And whatever the tension is equal to, that is just greater than zero because that's the condition we set earlier. We know that the tension is greater than zero. We said that the tension is greater than zero. So we just set this entire expression right here to, the, to greater than zero. And so let's just solve for r in this case. If we add an mg to both sides, we get this. And I notice that both sides have an m, so that cancels out. And also, let's distribute the 2 into the parentheses. And then we would get this exp expression. And let's multiply both sides by r. Then we, we would get this expression. And then let's add 4g, then let's add 4gr to both sides. Or let's add 4gr to the right, uh, to the right side then we would just get this expression. So 4gr plus gr, it just gives us 5gr. That's the same as saying 4 plus 1. And notice that both sides have a g, so that cancels out. And if we solve for the, ra the radius by dividing, if we try to divide both sides by 5, then we're able to isolate the radius r. So 2L divided by 5, we know that has to be greater than the radius, meaning that this value right here, 2L divided by 5, is the maximum value of the radius. So the radius can be, has to be less than this value in order for the, ra in order for the bob to swing in a full circle. So we can just rewrite this by just flipping the equation. So the radius is less than 2L divided by 5. So this is the expression right here. This is the final answer right here. This is the maximum value of R if the bob is to swing around in a full circle. Meaning, 
if the radius right here, let's say the radius was greater than 2L divided by 5, then we know that the bob will not, the pendulum will not be able to swing in a full circle. But if the radius is less than 2L divided by 5, meaning if it satisfies this expression, then we know that the bob will be, will be able to swing, or that we would know that the pendulum will be able to swing in a full circle if it satisfies this condition right here. So the bob will be able to go in a full circle since since the radius is less than 2L divided by 5, and we also know that if the bob is able to go in a full circle, the tension has to be greater than 0. Since the tension is what allows it to swing in a full circle. So this is the final answer right here.